Hi, everyone, and welcome to Design TV by Sandow. Today, we're going to be talking about some groundbreaking research and some amazing initiatives on how we can fight climate change with interior design. Um, for any of you who have been following the conversations around carbon and carbon neutrality this year, some, we started there with some big pledges, Microsoft pledging to go carbon negative by the year 2040, Amazon signing on three major partners um, to go carbon neutral by 2030. So some amazing commitments this year, but within our industry, within architecture and design, a lot of the attention has focused on architecture, on structure and envelope and the difference we can make there. Because as we look to bring down our carbon emissions, the focus has shifted to what we call embodied carbon. Embodied carbon, of course, being all the emissions, all that smoke and carbon dioxide we put in the air, um, in the process of extracting materials, turning them into products and assembling those products into buildings, right? So all the things that happen before the building actually opens to the public and the lights get turned on. Um, and that carbon, that we call embodied carbon, um, we've focused most of our attention on sort of what we've understood as the big offenders, carb concrete, I'm sorry, steel, right? Uh, those things in our in studies so far have accounted for the biggest percentage of embodied carbon, but that's because studies have focused on the structure and the envelope of buildings. Interior design, as interior designers know, is an entirely other ball game. Interiors turn over every few years, especially commercial interiors are renovated every few years. So the carbon footprint of interior design is a complex thing to understand. And yet new research shows that interior designers can do more than they think. Um, and so to talk about that today, we have an amazing group of panelists. Uh, we have with us Jennifer Chen, who's an interior designer with LMN Architects in Seattle, who's done a groundbreaking study on the embodied carbon of interior renovations, um, looking at LMN's own office as an example. Uh, we have with us Lisa Conway, who is the VP of Sustainability Americas at Interface, which launched its first carbon negative products as part of the Embodied Beauty Collection. Carbon negative, meaning that it's not just that they, these products don't have a carbon footprint, but that they actually give back to the environment, they offset or sequester carbon. So that's absolutely fantastic. Also with us today is Megan Lewis, who's a senior researcher at the Carbon Leadership Forum, who has studied the carbon footprint of a tenant improvement project at WeWork. Tenant improvement, of course, is um, one of the major fields of work for commercial interior designers in particular. So we're excited to hear what she has to say as well. Thank you all so much for joining me today. This is fantastic. Sure. Thank you. Jen, um, you studied the renovations that your office has um, gone through since the building that it's a part of was built in 1960. So we're talking about a 60 year period um, and multiple renovations in that period. Tell us a little bit about what you found in terms of embodied carbon. Yeah, so <clears throat> the Norton building that our office exists in has been in existence for 60 years, but our office actually moved in um, in 84, so we've been there about 36 years. Um, yeah, and like Avi was saying, uh, you know, as an interior designer, I started really wondering what uh, the impact it would be for the TI uh, cyclical renovations, um, because a lot of times when we look at the finishes or the interior and body carbon impact of a point in time or when the building is first built. It's only a fraction, sometimes, you know, 17%, something less than 20%. So it's not significant compared to structure and envelope. Uh, but when we used our own uh, office as case studies, even only in the 36 years we've been in the building, um, uh, we went through a cycle of renovation about every nine years. And what we found was um, we studied the cumulative embodied carbon of all the renovations only through 36 years and the overall embodied carbon impact um, is actually almost three quarters of what uh, structure would have been. Um, and, you know, because as obvious that the building is 60 years old, um, and if we had been in that building for 60 years, and we can assume that maybe nine years prior to our first move in, we had another renovation. So if we added all that up together, um, the cumulative embodied carbon of interiors um, or the cyclical interior renovations actually surpasses both structure and envelope. So 
the impact is quite big and um, our office at least the current iteration actually has a very minimal palette um, and it's open office with open ceilings not a lot of walls so you can see if we start to add in all the little pieces that go in interior design or interior finishes um, it's actually quite a big of impact even just in a short um, span of a few cyclical renovations this is a huge <laughs> deal um you know I, I can't believe that you know for such a long time we've entirely missed the idea that interiors are taken out and put back in every few years and therefore that the embodied carbon would add up you know so what looks like 17 percent when a building is new over time as tenants come in and leave and come in and leave um that's as much as you know structure and envelope which is what you found it's it's absolutely astounding um, but it also is a message of hope, right? It means that there's a lot that we can do as the interior design industry to contribute to that larger fight against climate change. Um, so thank you so much, Jen, for the work that you've done. Megan, um, I want to get into a little bit of detail with you. Um, you worked on the single tenant improvement project, basically when we were moved into um, a space. Um, you were, that was a project that was done with IA Interior Architects and Carbon Leadership Forum, um, where you now work, um, actually conducted the study for you. Um, what interior elements had the biggest embodied carbon footprints? Um, were there any surprises there? So as you analyzed all the elements within that single tenant improvement, um, what do you find? Yeah, so um, unlike the office that Jen just described, not, WeWorks aren't all open plan, so there's a balance of different types of spaces, um, and especially with some really small office spaces with just a couple of people. Um, one of the things that was, you know, the, the largest element to consider uh, in that uh, study was the walls, so the glass and storefront in particular, um, the aluminum glass, and then following that, the interior walls. So uh, the wall board, the insulation, the studs. And so uh, one of the things that uh, that sort of shows you, especially with the interior walls, is that there's a lot that can happen before you need to sacrifice, sacrifice, because there are obviously a lot of beautiful low carbon products out there. But before aesthetics are really even competing, um, that where there's a lot of data available um, and lower carbon solutions that are out there. And because this hasn't been as much of a part of the conversation so far, I think there's been some missed opportunities to take advantage of those. Um, because it's one of those both and not either or situations and, and then there was also a little bit um and this is looking ahead a little to what research still needs to happen is around hvac and lighting those were quite those were following walls for us um and so those are things where there aren't necessarily as obvious of solutions but um that's why we need to start thinking about it now right absolutely you know i think I, that's really interesting and you made an important point there so you know while we have to care about the embodied carbon because it adds up over time. But any interior designer is responsible for the renovation that they're working on now. So you kind of have to think about your contribution to that cumulative carbon footprint. And within that contribution, you've pointed out something really important that, you know, before you start to talk about, oh, like, you know, um, we don't have options for this, options for that, the big contender is interior partitions and, and walls. Um, and so, you know, making the right layout um, decisions itself can have a huge impact, um, you know, so thank you for pointing that out. Um, as you said, MEP, um, so lighting and mechanicals, electrical plumbing, um, there's still st still work to be done on that. We, we don't know fully the impact of those things. Um, and of course, following that, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, casework, millwork, furniture, and flooring definitely, definitely are, are close followers onto that um, as part of your study. Um, so, you know, that's really interesting is I think it gives us a hierarchy in terms of, you know, what we need to focus on um, in terms of lowering carbon footprint. Um, because we know that the little bit that we do now can make a huge impact over the life cycle of a building. And that's the power interior designers have. Um, Lisa, can you talk to me about how Interface is responding to this idea? I mean, you've been thinking about this for a while now. Um, tell us about how you got to carbon negative with your new products and what the implications are. Yeah, so um, so a lot of our history is obviously tied to our mission uh, from 25 years ago, mission zero. So we've kind of been working to lower the carbon footprint of our products over those 25 years and nobody cared. You know, like no, this was not, there was no metropolis, you know, 
gathering on embodied carbon. Like that was just not happening. So we definitely did have um, a head start. But I think one of the interesting things is when you have a, a goal that really sounds impossible, which was when we launched our new mission in 2016 to reverse global warming, how can we uh, take that and apply it to products? Um, that was something that was, we, were, we knew how to think about how to get to zero, but ultimately we wanna be restorative. And I think that you know both Megan and Jen, like ultimately the reason that we're um, measuring how much the problem is, is to ultimately the moonshot goal is to get to buildings as carbon sinks. You know, how can we design buildings that are actually part of the solution? Because just releasing less over time is not going to get us there. We need to actually draw down um, all of the excess waste carbon that we've put up into the atmosphere. So that has been a really exciting challenge. Um, carpet, if you're not paying attention, can be one of the big offenders, especially when you don't have a lot of walls. So really thinking about like, what are the hot spots of your space? We work is kind of unique in that there are a lot of partitions. We've moved a lot to open office in other types of cases. So flooring is a bigger contributor if you're not paying attention. Um, so this is an exciting week that we're actually recording this because on Tuesday um, we launched our first carbon negative carpet tile, um, which actually stores more carbon than has been released to make it. Um, so that is just kind of pointing us towards what's possible, hopefully for a lot more products than just flooring. Um, so that we can get to those, you know, carbon, carbon negative spaces, uh, carbon negative buildings someday. Um, that's been really, really an exciting kind of beacon, I think, in this conversation, because usually it's like hemp or, you know, something supernatural. It's not the materials that we're typically used to all the time. Um, but now you can get a product that, um, you know, that performs and looks the same as it always has, but has this kind of additional feature of really being restorative to the planet. You know, this is the thing that interior designers um, have going for them. Right. Um, this is where we're lucky that we're in this industry because, you know, when when um, architects found out that, you know, structure and envelope concrete had such a big, um, you know, carbon impact, it's taken years to find solutions for low carbon concrete. The nice thing about interiors is that, as Megan pointed out, and as Lisa is saying, you know, we have manufacturers who have been on the forefront at sort of ahead of the curve on this understanding that you know the day is going to come when they're going to have to lower their carbon footprint um, and have kind of prepared for that so we're lucky we do have options for low carbon products available not in all categories but certainly in some high impact categories um, you know and flooring being one of them so thank you so much lisa for for taking us through that because i think that's really important um, to all of you i'd love to i'd love to hear you know so now we know that interiors are part of the problem and therefore part of the solution, right? We know that we have to do something about this. Um, we didn't have the data until now, but at least now we can start to say studies and numbers are pointing us to the fact that interiors have a much bigger impact than we've ever guessed before. Now that we're at this juncture, what is sort of the long-term um, process we need to take? Like how do interior designers how does the interior design industry as a whole, designers, manufacturers, you know, our contractors, clients, all of us together, um, work towards bringing down embodied carbon emissions? I think that whether you're, no matter where you sit in this conversation, whether you're a manufacturer or a designer or a building owner, I think it's, it's about thinking about the emissions beyond just what you emit and into the supply chain. You know, where for someone like Jen, LMNs, um, operational energy impact is not big. You know, their biggest lever is the supply chain of all the stuff they specify. Um, when Megan was at WeWork, it wasn't WeWork's operations, it was the supply chain. We need to do both, but I think that the reason that we're having this conversation is because we all know how to think about um, operational carbon. You know, at home, it's about saving money on our energy bill, um, et cetera. What, we're trying to shine a light on is really thinking beyond that to 
parts of our carbon impact that we influence but may not control at interface that's not we don't make our own yarn um, but we're responsible for the impact of that yarn because that's what we make our products with so really using the opportunity to not only focus on what we control but also what we influence and having those conversation and, and, and using our buying power and spec power, et cetera, um, to be able to have those conversations with, um, with, for us, our top suppliers, you know, really for anyone in the conversation with your top suppliers to really move the needle. Right. right. Yeah. Oh, jumping in um, from an interior designer uh, point of view, I mean, like Lisa said, the spec power, I think, um, it's taking that next step and really thinking about what product are you putting into your, like you said, the current project, because, you know, there's the, the time that we're trying to race to for um, carbon neutrality and uh, comparing the products and knowing what's out there and continuing to kind of push for transparency um, is, the, is the level that I think we've been communicating to the manufacturers at. And then now is the time that we can now take the next step and really compare the information that we get from this disclosures from manufacturers and understanding what um, decisions you can make to lower your impact in your practice. Yeah. And I, jumping in and a sort of um, thinking even beyond just exactly what product you use, which is a super important part of actually following through on making design decisions around body carbon. But I tend to think of it as sort of reuse, reduce, replace, optimize as a sort of four steps for your body carbon. I think some of those steps are going to continue to become uh, easier to do over time as better solutions. So reuse, for example, right now is an area that is still somewhat you know it's it's at the beginning of the having a better reuse marketplace in the u.s you know whether that's refurbished furniture or actually just harvesting building materials at the end of a building life so that they have a longer life um and then for reducing products if it's a really high impact product then use less of it um and then on and then the sort of replace and optimize are more thinking about looking at different kinds of products that you could be using. Um, and then optimize is really the, okay, I'm picking a carpet. There's a carbon negative carpet, and then there's one that has a high impact. That's hopefully a no brainer. <laughs> right. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about sort of um, the end of life of projects as well. Um, from all of your point of view, you know, obviously that's the key thing for interior designers, right? So we're designing this project. We know that you know in 10 years or so it's going to be renovated in some way, um, and you know whether it should be or not, we can have that conversation. But you know, continuing the status quo now, we know that you know 10 years renovation is likely going to happen. Um, how do we plan for that 10-year mark as sort of responsible stewards now? So if you're if you're specifying and making decisions for a project now, um, what are some of the things we should keep in mind? you know, for looking at sort of that end of life or demolition, disassembly, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, I really want to reiterate um, the importance of the point that Megan made in terms of reuse and that end of life. And I think of the circular economy um, concept and I tend to think of carbon as uh, something that you invest and not something that you want to spend. So if you can recapture um, a material um, and extend its useful life, you're kind of putting that carbon back into process and you're not just wasting that. Um, and I, I, we talked about this a little bit um, in that if a building owner can go into a building and see what is in the building as something that has um, value after its, for, you know, its current renovation cycle, um, then you can put that back into the next renovation and save not only um, in the economy sense, but also in terms of lowering the embodied carbon because you're not putting something into the landfill and having to buy something new. Um, and if we can design for deconstruction as much as we think about how something go together, then that would also help that process because then you can easily take something apart and keep its value um, and without damaging the material. So that's something that would be uh, interesting to put into practice. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and there are some solutions that are out there um, that are a little, they're not quite as exciting because they're basically involved paperwork and contracts, fun things like that. But um, for example, there are carpet take back programs. There are furniture reuse programs where at the end of a project's life, they can be donated or bought by other um, companies. But that involves um, really educating the project team, including the owner. Um, and so having seen this from both the architect's point of view as well as the owner's point of view, um, that's a communication point that gets dropped sometimes because I mean, it's difficult, it's 10 years out. So there's a high likelihood that everyone on that team could be different. Uh, and so making sure that it's written into documents in a way that people can find it later is tricky, but we need to get better at it. Thanks. Yeah, and I, I would say like one of, the, one of the most frustrating things for us as a manufacturer is to see our product only be down for five years um, because it's, it's made to last so much longer than that. You know, some of our education and healthcare customers will keep it down um, you know, 20 plus years, but a lot of our corporate customers, which is the bulk of our work, that stuff cycles out so fast. Um, so anytime there's an opportunity, even if you're not keeping it in the space, donating it for re reuse in the local community, um, I think is something that everybody on the project can feel good about. Um, or it can, in our case, certainly come back to us. Um, we don't get enough material back by and large um, from most projects. Most projects do not send that back unless it's a lead IDNC project where that's really being measured for a specific purpose. Um, we would love to get more of it back. Um, and one of the things that can be really missing in the conversation, um, everybody has a take back program right, a take back program. Um, one of the things to really do the checks and balances on take back programs is, is what happens to it? Where is the post-consumer recycled content in your new products? Um, because there's a lot of lack of transparency around take back programs um, that is just sorely missing. So that's kind of an extra layer. I know it's an extra thing to do, but if you learn it on one project, you know, you can take that knowledge to the next one. Um, but all of that, you know, first keep it in place, second donate it in your community, you know, third send it back to the manufacturer, but make sure that if you're sending it back that you know what's happening to it. Right. Um, you know, I, I'm sure we're going to hear this, uh, Lisa, and I'm sure you hear it every time you bring this up with corporate clients. Um, I know Jen, you know, you, you will relate to this as well, right? It's often like it uglies out before it wears out, right? So. Um, people want to change things because they want change. They want to change in their environment. They want, you know, they, they have a different philosophy. They moved into a space that was occupied by somebody else, right? So there's a lot of reasons why um, interiors get ripped out. There's lots of cultural reasons. And I'm just wondering if we can reflect a little bit on the cultural shift that we need, that we need to foster as interior designers. Um, you know, what kind of, you know, aesthetics do we need to be open to? How can we change this culture of renovation um, without, you know, designing ourselves out of a job? Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of what we sell is, most of what we sell is gray. So like, if someone can't work with gray, I don't know, like, <laughs> you know, like a lot of the stuff that's down is okay. Um, and I think people just have like, they have trouble getting past it. So, you know, Jen can probably weigh in and, and probably Megan too, just on um, what can stay. And I think the before and afters of, you know, this is what it looked like and we were using what was already there and this is what it looks like now. It doesn't have to be a complete replacement. And I think we're not used to that as a society. Yeah, I would say, um... Yeah, people talk about timeless design a lot and I think just by nature, maybe that's not how we think about uh, spaces right now. We, I mean, we try to make it timeless, but of course, time change and you don't know what the next trend is going to be. Um, but I think really thinking about the longevity um, and why you really need something in the space um, versus it's easier to rip everything out, but being that steward for every material that you put in, like Lisa said, like if you chose it, there must be merits to it. Um, how do you want make uh, or extend its life and its useful life? And if not, have a plan for that end of life where it's not going to the landfill. Um, that should be part of the design process, in my opinion, um, to really think about 
what the next step would be for this material. Um, and then just in terms of cultural shift, thinking about that uh, design for the next life would be important. Okay. Megan, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's also thinking about um, which, and this goes back to designing for disassembly, thinking about um, each product and what the components are and whether all of them need to be replaced is another approach. So the same way that carpet developed tiles so that you could replace just individual tiles, thinking about things like furniture and other upholstery where, I mean, that they need to be able to be taken off part of it. So you're not throwing away a metal <laughs> or high quality wood product just because you got a stain on one part. And that goes the same with, you know, the ugling out problem. It's fine, then change the fabric, but don't get rid of really durable, high quality products um, before they need to be done. And I think part of it also does come to, you know, talking to, to owners about whether that needs to happen. And for some, I mean, and some things, you know, well, yeah, when I was at WeWork, there was a lot of uh, people want their specific brand on every single piece of furniture. And then every time that changes, does that really all need to be turned over? Um, and so that's going to be a longer term cultural shift around when we change a product standard, do we need to go in and replace every single chair or can we wait until the end of those chairs life, things like that. Right, right, absolutely. I mean, you know, it seems like the fundamental way in which our interior design is, is um, distinct from maybe the practice of architecture. And uh, I just want to say, even though we've been treating these as two sort of isolated professions, they're of course linked and they're, they're almost, you know, melded into each other these days. But, um, you know, the thing about interior design or interiors work in general is that, you know, uh, we have to go into the project considering that we're picking up the baton from the last interior designer that touched that space. Really having respect for their work as we go into our work, um, you know, it seems to be a way for us to at least build that culture that, that all of you have talked about really, um, you know, in terms of having respect for the materials that are already there. Um, I'd love to close this out with um, maybe one thing from each of you that that you wish interior designers would start paying more attention to. Um, you've mentioned a lot of things already, you know, just pick one that people can start doing now in their work, um, you know, to start paying attention now that we know that our work has such a huge impact on climate change. Yeah, I'll start. I mean, I, the, the thing that comes to mind for me is that I, I meet so many interior designers who are passionate about climate change. Um, but will leave the work of carbon impact of buildings to architects and engineers. And I think that this whole conversation and tools that have come online, like the EC3 tool, um, you know, it gives you a place to start um, so that you can actually be part of the conversation because the impact is huge. The impact is so much bigger in those specifications than what you do in your personal life. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll meet vegans who like they do all these amazing things, you know, in their personal life. But then when it comes to spec, it's like, oh, I just never have the right client, you know, so they'll, they'll spec whatever. So really just it's all one life, you know, so if we can tie those things together, um, we can make huge impact and we are an important part of the conversation. Yeah, um, kind of picking back on that, I would say the biggest thing I think for interior designers is to know that you have the power and to push yourself into that conversation early on um, and you know set the sustainability goals with your internal team with the client and that will really help you in the long run um, and this is coming of course uh, secondary to really understanding what your own impact is <clears throat> excuse me and how you can make that uh, difference yeah, and I'd say if you want to further educate yourself, the, there are those two studies that the Carbon Leadership Forum has done are available. You can download them and look at what those impacts are over time, as well as diving into a specific project. Um, and also think about how, um, you know, don't assume that your owner doesn't care because they don't know about interiors and, and embodied carbon. You know, if they have a carbon neutrality commitment that's more around operational, it's an opportunity to talk to them about what do you know about scope three emissions? Did you know that interiors are a really big part of scope three emissions? And th they're interested in that. They just don't know that there's a misconnect around language. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of conversations to happen um, around that. That's a great point. Right, absolutely. 
um, you know, I started this conversation talking about the big um, commitments that large, you know, big tech has made in this past year to carbon neutrality or carbon negativity. Um, you know, Salesforce, um, as part of their, you know, uh, commitment, has pledged that 2020 on every interior space is also going to be assessed for embodied carbon. So there's there's cultural change on the horizon. It's coming, and I think as a profession what all of you have shown through your work and your research, your studies, is a path to the rest of us um, to really um, start to look at this in our work and to prepare ourselves for an inevitable future. We have 10 years uh, to reverse the impacts of, you know, 300 years or so of the Industrial Revolution. Um, there's a lot of of uh, carbon dioxide and methane and stuff that we've put in the atmosphere that we need to take back. And interior designers, interior designers can be a huge part of that. Um, so thank you all so much for sharing your expertise and your time with us today. Um, for everybody who's listening, uh, please go out there, educate yourself. You can do more than you think, and you have a much bigger impact than you realize. Uh, please um, go to the Carbon Leadership Forum's website. Um, their study is freely available. Um, you know, please look at Interface's products. Uh, please start to prioritize low carbon products in your work and start to understand your place within that cyclical renovation cycle and act accordingly um, because you have tremendous power because of that. Uh, thank you all so much for joining me today. This has been a wonderful conversation uh, and I hope the start of a really positive change in our industry. Thank you. Thanks, thank you.